Go ahead, Mataji. Go ahead. Today we are very fortunate. Today's class is given by His Grace, Nitya Krishna Prabhu, uh, Sri Madhavagvatam. Prabhuji, are you there? Yes, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisance. These all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. Thank you for your association, Prabhuji. Please take over this call, Prabhu. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Thank you very much, all assembled Vaishnavas, for this opportunity to discuss this most glorious Srimad Bhagavatam. I have no qualification to speak, but we'll try to repeat what I've heard previously, and with all of your blessings, we can have a very fruitful and enjoyable discussion today. So today we're discussing the uh, fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter 9, verse 33. And the title of the chapter is Dhruva Maharaj Returns Home. Uh, read the Sanskrit and the uh, synonyms, translation, and purport, and then we'll begin our discussion. Daivi maya mupashritya prasupta iva binadre tapye dvitya api asati Patre patre vedid ruja. Daivim, of the personality of Godhead. Mayam, the illusory energy. Upashitya, taking shelter of. Prasuptaha, dreaming while asleep. Eva, like. Binadri, having separated vision. Tapye, I lamented. Vitye, in the illusory energy. Api, Although, asati, temporary, batre, brother, batrevya, enemy, rit, within the heart, duja, by lamentation. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada. Shila Prabhupada ki. Translation. Dhruva Maharaj lamented, I was under the influence of the illusory energy. Being ignorant of the actual facts, I was sleeping on her lap. Under a vision of duality, I saw my brother as my enemy, and falsely I lamented within my heart, thinking, they are my enemies. Purport. Real knowledge is revealed to a devotee only when he comes to the right conclusion about life by the grace of the Lord. Our creation of friends and enemies within this material world is something like dreaming at night. In dreams, we create so many things out of various impressions in the subconscious mind. But all such creations are simply temporary and unreal. In the same way, although apparently we are awake in material life, because we have no information of the soul and the supersoul, we create many friends and enemies simply out of imagination. Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami says that within this material world or material consciousness, good and bad are the same. This di- the distinction between good and bad is simply a mental concoction. The actual fact is that all living entities are sons of God, or byproducts of His marginal energy. Because of our being contaminated by the modes of nature, we distinguish one spiritual spark from another. That is also another kind of dreaming. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita that those who are actually learned do not make any distinction between a learned scholar, a brahmana, an elephant, a dog, or a chandala. They do not see in terms of external body. Rather, they they see the person as spirit soul. By higher understanding, one can know that the material body is nothing but a contamination of the five, excuse me, but a combination of the five material elements. In that sense, also, the bodily construction of a human being and that of a demigod are one and the same. From a spiritual point of view, we are all spiritual sparks, part and parcel of the Supreme Spirit, God. Either material or spiritually, we are basically one, but we make friends and enemies as dictated by the illusory energy. Duvarmaj therefore said, Devi mayam upashitya. The, the, the cause of his bewilderment was his association with the illusory material energy. Om Magya 
ಜ್ಞಾನಾಂಜನಾಶಲಾಕಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರು ಮಿಲಿತ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೆ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಯೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪ ಕದಾಮಯಂ ದಾತಿ ಸ್ವಾಪದಾಂತಿಕ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೋ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪದ ಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೂನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗದ ಸಹಗನಾ ರಘುನಾಥ ಮಿತ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಗನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನ ಬಂಧು ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾ ಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಾಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವಿಷಭಾನು ಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪರಮಾಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಾಂಚಕಲ್ಪ ತುಭ್ಯಶ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧು ಬೀವ ಪತಿತ ಪಾವನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪೃಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಿತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯ ಬಾರಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿಣೆ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸದಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೌನ್ ಸೊ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ರಿಪೀಟ್ ದ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ಆಫ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ನೈನ್ ಆಫ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಫೋರ್ ಧ್ರುವ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಲಮೆಂಟಿನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ಫ್ಲೂಯೆನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಲ್ಯೂಜರಿ ಎನರ್ಜಿ Being ignorant of the actual facts, I was sleeping on her lap. Under a vision of duality, I saw my brother as my enemy, and falsely I lamented within my heart, thinking, they are my enemies. So, this pastime of Dhruva Maharaj is spoke last week, and been speaking thus far, is very, very important in our... Um, study of, of Krishna consciousness. This is a path that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu studied uh, virtually daily uh, with his dear friend, Gadadar Pandit, Jagannath Puri. And we have many, many lessons from this pastime. And we see um, in these last few verses that we've been discussing a mood of lamentation. And so we'll discuss today Um, I thought three topics to um, uh, discuss in, 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 this, in this verse based on the purports presented by Srila Prabhupada. So I thought we could we speak a little bit about real knowledge. Uh, Srila Prabhupada opens this purport speaking about how real knowledge is revealed. And then we'll speak about this l- mood of lamentation and how to overcome lamentation. What was the cause of Dhruva Maharaja's lamentation? What is the cause of our lamentation? and how we can overcome it. Krishna gives very, very clear instruction in Bhagavad Gita about how to overcome lamentation. And then we'll speak about our dear friend, Maya Devi, the illusory energy, and how we can understand her role in uh, creating this sense of duality and how we can overcome the powerful illusory energy. to see things as they are, as Srila Prabhupada comments, to awaken from our dreaming state and come to our real consciousness. So, uh, with your permission, I thought we could speak about these three topics a little bit in understanding this pastime of Dhruva Maharaj. So, just a, a short synopsis, uh, as it seems by the introductions, most have been participating in his calls from some time, so I don't want to repeat what is already known. Uh, but just... for the sake of completeness, the, this pastime, as we know, begins with um, Dhruva Maharaj being uh, denied the opportunity to sit on the lap of his father. Um, and this created great angst and, and anger in the mood of, of Dhruva Maharaj, being 
from Kshatriya lineage. He exhibited this great uh, uh, mood and became very, very upset by this opportunity. And following <coughs> the instructions of his mother, who guided him how he can overcome this lamentation, this, this not this lamentation, excuse me, but this initial um, mood of, of disappointment, he was instructed to go to the forest. And there he had the great fortune of meeting Narada Muni, who instructed him, first challenged him, how sincere are you in really uh, obtaining this great boon that he had wanted, which is a kingdom greater than even his, his great-grandfather, um, Lord, who is Lord Brahma. And in this way, uh, he showed great sincerity, and Narada Muni initiated him in the chanting of the great mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And with sincerity and enthusiasm, Juva Maharaj performed uh, this devotional service. And in a very short period of time, relatively speaking, within six months, he had performed such intense austerity and intense devotional service that he was fortunate to receive the audience of Lord Vishnu himself. And Lord Vishnu fulfilled his desire to obtain uh, a, a kingdom even greater than that of Lord Brahma. Now we know Lord Brahma is, is, is overseeing the entire material universe. And yet, Krishna, Lord Vishnu was able to fulfill that desire by giving him even in a superior position in the <coughs> Goloka. So, that brings us to this point now, which is where Dhruva Maharaj is now expressing some lamentation, thinking that he could have done much more. He could have obtained something even more beneficial. So that brings us to this verse uh, of the 33rd verse. So let's begin with a little bit of discussion about real knowledge. Um, Srila Prabhupada comments in the opening uh, sentence of this uh, purport, real knowledge is revealed to a devotee only when he comes to the right conclusion about life by the grace of the Lord. So we say real knowledge. Real knowledge means knowledge that gives the real truth or eternal truth. Material knowledge, as we know, we, we may study in all the great, great universities of the world. We may obtain knowledge about so many things, different sciences, engineering, different business tactics, whatever it may be, unlimited fields of study it seems. But all of that knowledge provides very temporary benefit. And we can say no real, tangible, long-term result. That no matter how much material knowledge we acquire, as soon as we leave this body, all that knowledge is gone. And we again have to start all over again. Albert Einstein, the great mathematician and physicist, in his next life immediately had to begin again from 2 plus 2, learning it all over again. So real knowledge is that which is eternal, which stays with us. And as Krishna has promised us in the Bhagavad Gita, that there is no loss or diminution and whatever we gain in spiritual knowledge, we retain with us. And wherever we leave off at the end of this life, we pick up again from that point forward in our next life. And so this real knowledge brings us to understand basically three principles. If we want to summarize all of our spiritual knowledge that we are acquiring through study of this Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagavad Gita are three main principal scriptures that Srila Prabhupada advised us to study with great sincerity. It, it really brings us to understand three things. Who am I? Who is Krishna? And what is my relationship with Krishna? If we try to synthesize everything that we are studying, it brings us to understanding these three things. Who am I? Who is Krishna? And what is my relationship with Krishna? So we can try not to overcomplicate things as we study the various aspects of this beautiful philosophy. We can kind of keep this in the 
in our mind as we just try to understand these three things. And this is real knowledge because real knowledge generates real results. And the real result that we all want from any knowledge is peace and happiness. We, we see people around us, they acquire so much knowledge in these various fields so that it may, they may be able to manipulate matter in a way to achieve happiness. That's it. And so real knowledge is the means in which we can understand how to find this eternal happiness. Now real knowledge, Srila Prabhupada is guiding us, this knowledge of who am I, who is Krishna in our relationship. It is descending knowledge. It is not knowledge that is that we can uncover on our own. We obtain this knowledge through the descending process of Guru Parampara. That is the only means to know Krishna. Through the process of devotional service, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that he can only be known by this process of devotional service. So, this knowledge that we are trying to attain, we must always remember, it is coming by the grace of the Lord. We know that by the mercy of Guru, we can get Krishna. And by the mercy of Krishna, we get Guru. So, we just chanted, Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakya Chakshuru Militam Yene Dasmai Shri Guru Venama We are offering our obeisances to Guru, who is opening our eyes with the torch of knowledge. We cannot open our own eyes. Because we have not seen the truth, we cannot see it ourselves. So, this knowledge we obtain through the process of following the instructions of Guru Parampara and in the practice of devotional service. Krishna assures in the 10th chapter in the Chatur Sloki verses of Bhagavad Gita, he says, Dadami buddhi yogam tam. I will give you the intelligence. I will dispel all the darkness. So that is his great benediction to those who practice devotional service. That he will give us this real knowledge so that we may obtain this real result that we are searching. This is Srila Prabhupada's opening um, of this purport to remind us of how we obtain uh, this very important information through the process of mercy of Guru and Krishna. Now let's speak a little bit about lamentation. So clearly, Dhruva Maharaj is lamenting. These last several verses, he is lamenting about his situation here. And lamentation occurs only when one of two things are there. Either we want something and we don't have it. Then we lament. I would like a rasgula and I don't have it in front of me. And thus I lament. Or, if I have something and I fear that I'll lose it. So I may be having some great wealth or some great beauty. But my fear is that I'll lose it. And so I lament. That is the source of all lamentation. So we can see that in the material world, the material world is full of lamentation. Because everything is temporary. Krishna says, this world is dukkhalayam and ashashvakam. It is dukkha, full of misery. Because everything is temporary. If you have something that you desire, because it's temporary, it means shortly you will again be separated from that thing that you desire, whatever it may be. And many of the things that we want we don't reach because we know our desires, our material desires, never become satisfied, never become satiated. This greed can never be satisfied. So there is constant lamentation in this material world. Everything in this world, as as uh, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami uh, comments in the purport, says within this material world of material content, good and bad are the same. There's no value in this material world. We 
know the, 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 the story of Sanatan Goswami and the touchstone. Once there was a, 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 a devotee of Lord Shiva from Kashi and he was desiring to marry his daughter. And he had no wealth, no money to execute his duty of marrying his daughter. And so he prayed to Lord Shiva for some money. And Lord Shiva, being very kind and compassionate to this person, told him, you go to Vrindavan, and there you go find Sanatan Goswami, and he will help you. He has great wealth. And so this Brahmana goes with great endeavor from Kasi to Vrindavan is not some small distance, and this is not in the era of airplane or automobile travel. So he was going... And he made his way to Vrindavan, and there he was inquiring, who is this Sanatan Goswami, who is this Sanatan Goswami? And at this point, Sanatan Goswami was very well known for his great uh, advancement in spiritual life. And so they directed him to where he was. He was sitting nearby the Yamuna, not too far, uh, or in the area of Kaliagat. That's what he was saying. And this... Uh, and the gentleman asked, Sanatana Goswami, I've been instructed to come to you for some great wealth. And I understand you have. And Sanatana Goswami says, I have some, no great wealth, but I have this touchstone that is being kept here under a pile of trash, <laughs> garbage. If you like, you can have that. And so this gentleman became very, very excited. Oh, a touchstone. It means I can touch anything to it and it will turn into gold. Started to think about how much wealth he could create from this touchstone, unlimited. The most materialist this would seem, or at all, would be the end-all, be-all of life, the most perfect thing to achieve. So... Gentleman took this touchstone, removing all the trash and garbage, and, and began to walk away. And then he thought, wait a minute, if this is so valuable, able to produce jewels at the moment's touching of anything to it, why was this Sanatan Goswami keeping it under a pile of trash? And so he went back. Then, my dear sir, Sanatan Goswami, I have one question. If this is of so much value, why are you keeping it under trash? You must have something even more valuable, more beneficial. So now his greed for something even better propelled him. So Sanatan Goswami said, yes, I have something way more valuable than this touchstone. Said, Please tell me. So I can tell you, but you first must take this touchstone and deposit it in the Yamuna, throw it into the river. He was testing this person's faith. And so this person, seeing the value and the performance of this touchstone, had faith, and so he went to the Yamuna and threw. And then he returns to Sanatan Goswami, and Sanatan Goswami explains to him the process of chanting the holy names of the Lord. And says, it explains to him, there's nothing of value in this material world. But the greatest of value that we can receive is the chant process of chanting the Holy Name. And he said, you just chant, and don't worry, Krishna will arrange everything. Whatever your needs are, whatever your duties are, everything will be fulfilled. By rendering service to the Supreme Lord, we have no other responsibilities to fulfill. They all become automatically satisfied. Just like watering the root of the tree satisfies all the branches of that tree. All the different things we have to do, including marrying your daughter, that will also be taken care of. But you just chant. So in this, we see the real value in this world is somehow coming in contact with the teachings of our great six Goswamis, who would show us that nothing in this world has of any value. So Dhruva Maharaj is lamenting. And he is lamenting that 
he's wasted a great opportunity. Just in a couple of verses prior, it says, in six months, he was receiving the darshan of the Supreme Lord. Six months. And great, great sages, personalities have formed incredible austerities and service. And after many lifetimes and many, many years they were able to see the Lord, but he was so fortunate that in just six months he was able to see the Lord. But when he saw the Lord, it was, he was feeling, I had asked for something very, very temporary, a very temporary boon when I could have received the eternal boon of freedom from this birth, death, old age and disease. You know, we can try to understand this lamentation with maybe an analogy. It'd be like, you know, if we hear that a rich man, a very rich, rich person, is giving away great wealth, extraordinarily generously, anyone who asks them for anything, he's giving away without a moment's hesitation. And we approach that person and we ask them for just a few grains of broken rice. And we might think after such an encounter, wow, I could have asked for so much more, but I asked for just a few grains of broken rice. So Durga Maharaj is experiencing this lamentation. He asked for something that seems extraordinary, which is the a, a, a planet higher than even that of Lord Brahma. But he be, by the mercy of the Lord, having the great association of the Lord, he came to this knowledge that what he had asked for was extraordinarily insignificant in comparison to having the opportunity to render pure devotional service to the Lord. So, this lamentation that Dhruva Maharaj was experiencing was, was very extreme because he felt that an opportunity he had was now wasted. Sometimes we don't value the opportunity we have in this life. You know, we, we, are, we have appeared in this world, we are born in this era of Kali Yuga, and on, on the one hand, it is very, you know, treacherous and we, the age of Kali and we, we speak about how Kali Yuga is progressing. But actually, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have been born in this time period. If we look at the time span of Lord Brahma and one day, it's four plus billion years 4.3 billion years. And we have had the greatest of fortune of appearing just 500 years after Krishna himself came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to establish this process of devotional service. It is the greatest of fortune to have been born in this time so recent to when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come and establish this process of devotional service. So it is a great fortune. And if we don't take advantage of that fortune, fully utilize the gift that Srila Prabhupada has given to all of us, we will also lament, thinking, I wasted an opportunity. Sometimes in our devotional life we think, you know, Krishna said there is no loss or diminution. Uh, I'll do the best I can this life, and then I'll just pick up in my next life. No problem. He says, chapter 8, you'll be born in a Vaishnava family or an aristocratic family. But we should not fail to realize that coming back will just be that much further removed from this great potency of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. So, to take advantage of our opportunity here and to avoid future lamentation should become very, very sincere in the practice of our devotional service. Otherwise, we'll lament just like Duvar Maharaj is lamenting. 
We may wonder, he has just seen the Supreme Lord with his own eyes, yet he is feeling unfulfilled. And the source of that unfulfillment, that lamentation, is that he had material desires in his devotional service. He had material desires. And these material desires prevented him from reaching or achieving the ultimate boon that one can reach from the practice of devotional service. So, we may want to know how to avoid this feeling of lamentation. And so Krishna gives us a very precise answer in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He says, Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma Nashotati Nakangshati Samasavarishu Bhutishu Mad Bhakti Lavate Param. Just as he's concluding the Bhagavad Gita, he says that Brahma Bhutta, when one becomes self realized, then one becomes fully joyful, Prasanatma. And he does not hanker for anything, does not lament for anything. And he becomes the well-wisher of all living entities. And in that state, he attains pure devotional service. So this lamentation stops, doesn't lament for anything, doesn't hanker for anything. When? One becomes self-realized. Realizing who am I? Spirit soul, part and parcel of Krishna, with the eternal occupation or duty of my Sanatana Dharma to render devotional service. And why that lamentation stops when we render service to Krishna, we want some, we should have some faith and understanding why. As I mentioned earlier, lamentation occurs when there is want of something that we don't have. There's an incompleteness, an incomplete feeling. I'm something I'm lacking. So when one renders devotional service to Krishna, one finds complete satisfaction. Because he is complete. When we are in relationship with the complete, we also feel fully complete. We know Om Purnam Adaha Purnam. Purna Purnam Adachate. Purna Se Purnam Eva Shate. Purnam Eva Vishishate. This Completeness. Krishna is complete. He is the only complete whole in all aspects. And so when we connect in loving devotional service to Krishna, having realized who I am, that is the only means to have complete satisfaction. And when we have complete satisfaction, there will be no lamentation. And this is where pure devotional service begins. Dhruva Maharaj had this lamentation that I had asked for something very temporary. He says in just the, I think, two verses prior. Um, just looking for that verse. Um, anyway, he says in the prior verses that I had the opportunity to achieve a permanent liberation, but I had asked for something very temporary as this you know, great kingdom. So he was lamenting. But in the practice of pure devotional service, we uncover that even something far superior to liberation is attainable. When we practice devotional service without any material desires, without any motives, this uttama, highest bhakti, when we have absolutely no desires, shunyam, no desires, and our only desire is to please Krishna, then one attains a state even so far superior to even being liberated. In, in, in preaching and in, in dis, dis, um, distributing 
this great philosophy. You know, in initial stages, we speak to people about how this material world is Dukkha It is full of birth and death, old age and disease. This Adiyatmik, Adibautik, Adidevi. These seven problems that stand in the way of our happiness. And we say, become free from all of this. Go back to the spiritual world. We speak mostly of liberation. And in a way to at least initially inspire those to take to the practice of devotional service. To become free from all these difficulties. But in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we see that by the practice of pure devotional service, there is something even far superior to gain. Rupa Goswami explains that as one practices pure devotional service there are different characteristics awarded to that practitioner of bhakti and as they move from sadhana bhakti to bhava bhakti to prema bhakti great things are awarded to that practitioner and in the sadhana bhakti this kleshagni shubhata this all the fire of material existence dissipated. Or said, actually in the way the verse says, that all the material difficulties are burned in fire. And all auspiciousness is bestowed upon this practitioner of pure devotional service at the stage of sadhana bhakti. But in the second stage, as one advances to bhava bhakti, we see that one is awarded this feeling of moksha lagutakrit. This is a very interesting and a very important thing for us to understand. That the, the concept of liberation, when one has experienced the bliss of pure devotional service in bhava bhakti, is very insignificant that one even ridicules liberation. Moksha Lagurutakrit. But we have to understand this in, in proper context, as Srila Prabhupada has guided us. That Moksha, this liberation, it is not insignificant. It is an extraordinary accomplishment to become free from this birth and death, old age and disease. It is quite extraordinary accomplishment to return back home to Vaikuntha, a place free of miseries. But what the point here is that that is extremely significant. But the bliss and the satisfaction of practicing pure devotional service is so far superior that liberation seems insignificant. Let me try to draw another analogy to help illustrate this point. Now, you go to... New York City, or some big city. Let's pick New York City. And you're standing on the sidewalk just below the tall skyscraper, the Empire State Building, or the Freedom Tower. And you look up. It's a gigantic structure. You have to take many steps back just to see the top of it. It's a gigantic structure. Huge building. Biggest you've ever seen. You might even pay some money and ride an elevator to go to the top of this building in the observation deck and just see how the world looks from this very high perch. And there you see everything seems very insignificant. The cars and buses and people and trees, everything seems so tiny. So this building is very significant. But now, after your vacation is over and you're flying out of the airport and you're flying over this city, you see that same building. Now that building seems very insignificant, like a small Lego piece. Because from your perspective now, you are so high, you are seeing something that isn't... But when you are on the ground, this building was so grand, you are willing to pay money to go to the top of it. And now this same building seems very insignificant. Like that... From the position we may be in today, the concept of liberation seems like a great goal. 
becoming free from birth and death. No more old age. No more needing to dye my hair. No more needing to deal with my arthritis pain and this and that. No more conflicts with other entities. No more worried about natural disasters. Wow, it seems great. But what Rupa Goswami is guiding us in nectar devotion is, but when one practices pure bhakti, pure devotional service, then one achieves such a satisfaction, so high, that liberation seems very insignificant. Just like that building seems insignificant when you're high in the sky, that this practice of bhakti is so sweet, so sublime, and so satisfying, that even this great achievement of liberation seems very small and minuscule. This is the power of devotional service. When we practice pure devotional service, we unlock this extraordinary potential to even make liberation feel insignificant. That is the happiness and peace and satisfaction of pure devotional service. And it continues. This is just the second stage of bhakti. When that matures into Krishna Prema, Rupa Goswami explains, you can multiply the happiness of the material world truly in fold. And it would not amount to even a tiny fraction of the happiness and satisfaction from the practice of devotional, pure devotional service and pure love of God. So with this knowledge, we can aim high, aim for what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told us. No material desire, nadanam, nadjanam, na sundarim. Nothing. Even liberation, jamani, jamani, shware, janma after janma. All I want is to be able to do devotional service. So, to protect ourselves from having any scope of ever lamentation, we can set the goal of our practice of Krishna consciousness to achieve the state of pure devotional service and aspire for awakening this dormant love of Krishna. It is lying dormant within all of our hearts. Though we speak of it being so great and so grand, we wonder, can I ever get it? But we should take great comfort that we already have it. It is just lying dormant within our hearts. And by the practice of sadhana bhakti, by the following the instructions of our great acharyas, we can awaken this dormant love of God. It is there within us. We don't have to go out to find it. This practice of bhakti is not to develop some new skill, Prabhupada explains. It is just to bring about that which is innate and natural to all of us. And this is the potential of pure devotional service. And when we practice our devotional service in understanding, I am spirit soul, and I was created for only one reason, I have only one purpose for existence, and that is to be enjoyed by Krishna. That sometimes takes us back. I was created just to be enjoyed by Krishna. But when we live our life in that mood, only mission to please the Supreme Lord, we achieve this most perfectional state of complete satisfaction. And that is the ultimate irony of this world. The more we try to enjoy, the less we do. And the more we try to be enjoyed by Krishna, the more we enjoy. That is what Real knowledge brings us to understand. That is what we have the great fortune by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada to begin to uncover and discover. So, 
how this desire to enjoy comes about. That brings us to our final topic today, which is Maya, the illusory energy. We were in the spiritual world, enjoying with Krishna, but we had this Icha and Dvesha, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, that we had this desire to enjoy independent of Krishna, to enjoy separate from Him. Now, there is no independent existence we can have. We can never be separated from Krishna. But we want that. We are unsatisfied. It's just like in our impure state, if we were to go back to Krishna today, in our impure state, we would be disappointed. Why? Because nobody would care about us. Everybody is fully focused, fully absorbed in pleasing Krishna. No one will notice how nice our dhoti looks or our sari looks or how nice we may do something or that. Everyone will be fully focused just on Krishna. So until we become fully focused on the pleasing of Krishna, having no self-desires, we have no ability to enter the spiritual world. So this desire to enjoy independent of the Lord became very pronounced. And Krishna said, well, you can go to the material world and there I have created an illusion. By the great service of my Shakti Tattva, Maya Devi, she is created an, creating an illusion where you can pretend to be separate from me. And there you can try to experience it. You won't like what you see. You'll find dukkha everywhere. But if that is your desire, I will fulfill it. I am your loving eternal father. Krishna is speaking to all of us. And if that is your desire, I'll fulfill it. Now we of all the jivas are in a great minority of those who accepted this foolish bargain and decided to come under the influence of Maya. So it is only by our desire that we came under the influence of Maya. Krishna says, Daivi Hesha. It is His divine energy. Sometimes we develop a mood of animosity towards Maya. We should remember, she is serving Krishna. And we are trying to serve Krishna. So actually we're on the same team. She is serving Krishna. And we are trying to serve Krishna. So this maya, but we know, is bewildering. We become trapped by her illusion. And this real knowledge dissipates. And we enter our dreaming state. And we start to see good and bad. This duality. Maya leads us to see duality. Actually, there is no duality. In the spiritual world, everything is great, perfect. There is no hot and cold. There is just perfect temperature. There is no you know, rich or poor. Everyone has unlimited resources. There is no beautiful and ugly. Everything is beautiful. It is just a one-sided coin. That is the spiritual world. But in the material world, it is full of duality. Good and bad, tall and short, rich and poor, intelligent, not so much. Everywhere we see. But Krishna Skavaraj Goswami is saying that within this material, good and bad are the same. And there are two ways to look at this. On the one hand, everything is bad in the material world when it's used for a sense gratification, because it's going to lead to misery. What we deem to be good, when we try to enjoy it separate from Krishna, it will lead to our misery. On the other hand, understanding this principle of yukta vairagya, everything in this world 
can be used in the service of Krishna, then it is great. It is Krishna's energy anyways. Everything is either a para para shakti. And when it's used in the service of Krishna, it has great value. So, this duality we see comes into play when we become under the influence of Maya. Once Narada Muni wanted to understand, after traveling the material world, he saw this Maya, this illusory energy. And so he went to go see Lord Narayan. And he waited to see him. And he asked Lord Narayan now, you know, what is this Maya? How does it work? How do people become bewildered by it? And Lord Narayan, understanding his eyes, said, my dear Narayan, let's go for a walk. And they entered a very beautiful garden, and they were walking down a road, beautiful flowers on each side, lovely trees, birds are chirping, very beautiful, serene place. And they're walking, and they come to one intersection, and Narada Muni expresses some desire for some water. He was feeling thirsty. He asked, my dear Narayan, is there some water nearby? He said, yes, just go this way, follow this little path, and there's a river there. You take some water. You go, I'll wait here for you. Narada Muni says, no problem, I'll be right back. And he followed the path, and he reached the river, and he thought, okay, here, I'll drink some water. So he folded his hands to make his biodegradable cup and was about to drop it into the water to receive, retrieve some water. And just as he was about to do that, one tribal man, some aboriginal man, came and said, oh, Narada Muni, great saint, you have come. Please don't drink water this way. I have kept some very nice water in a clay pot, cool water. Please come to my home and drink water. Please bless me with your presence in my home. And Narada Muni thought, yeah, not a bad idea. I can take some nice water here. Plus, this gentleman is very sweet and nicely asking. I shall go. So they, Narada Muni follows this man and walks a little distance and enters his small hut. And there this man sits Narada Muni down on a nice asana, washes his feet, receives him very nicely in the etiquette we understand how to receive a great saintly person. And then he offers him some water, and he says, Narada Muni, you have come all the way to my home. I cannot just offer you water. Please let me gather some quick fruits, beautiful, wonderful, sweet fruits are available here in the forest. I'll just be a few moments, please. You, wait, and let me grab some fruits. Narada Muni thought, yeah, some fruits would be nice, you know, and I, and I try some new fruits, let's see. So the man leaves, and he asks his daughter, you please take care of our guest. And daughter begins to offer a fan to Narada Muni and serving him very nicely. And the man had gone to gather some fruits. Meanwhile, who is waiting at the intersection? Lord Narayan. Narada Muni had completely forgotten. And he carries on. And after some time in this home, he develops a desire that he would like to marry this daughter. And so when the man comes back with the nice fruits, Narada Muni expresses his desire that, oh, you know, I'd like to marry your daughter. And is ecstatic. Wow, I, how I can find a more qualified groom. This great person is desiring becomes very, very enthusiastic and happy and arranges for the wedding. Wedding takes place. Still, Lord Narayan is waiting in this intersection. Wedding takes place. Narada Muni now enters household ashram and is tending to the fields and herding the cows and taking care of so many things. Then they have a small child, a baby boy is born. Like this time is passing. Narada Muni has f totally forgotten Lord Narayan, who's waiting. And he carries on like this. 
the baby is one day playing in the courtyard and Narada Muni and his wife are doing some household work and they hear some commotion outside Narada Muni not really disturbed but his wife thinks oh something might have happened to our son so Narada Muni says you go check so she goes out and they realized they were living just next to this river that Narada Muni had first went to. And the boy had fallen into the river. Narada Muni was inside the house, but still some time had passed and more commotion was going. And he thought, oh, maybe my wife has got into trouble. So he goes outside and sees his wife and son both had fallen into the river. And thus this commotion. So he's thinking how to save him. The torrents are going very, very fast. It's a very precarious situation. And he sees no hope to save both of them. And he decides, better I save my wife and we can have more sons. So let me... So he takes his vena and he turns it upside down. That top part of the vena has these little pegs that carry the string. And he began to dip that in and trying to catch her by her hair and fish her out of the water. And he's running along the shore trying to keep up with the current. And at one point along the shore the ground gives out and he falls into the river. And then he becomes in a very fearful state. And having no other hope he then chanced out Oh, Narayan! Narayan! And he regains his consciousness. All this time, Lord Narayan had been waiting. And immediately, he finds himself at the bank of the river, about to dip his hands in to take a sip of water. And Lord Narayan says, Now, Narada Muni, you have understood the power of Maya, of illusion. Slowly, she can... Pull us away. You came just to drink some water. And from drinking water, it went to the point of completely forgetting me, standing, waiting for you at the intersection. This is how Maya works. So Maya, when we come under her influence, works to fulfill our original desire, which is to forget Krishna. To be, have a sense of existence independent of Him. But because we can never be separated from Krishna, this illusion she creates has to be very strong, very powerful. Like a magician, in order to make something impossible seem possible, they have to create a great illusion. I'm going to saw this person in half and separate them. It's impossible. So they make a very powerful illusion to make it seem like it's happening. So similarly, to make the impossible seem real, like to be separate from Krishna, Maya has a very strong illusory ability. But that illusory energy is working only under the direction of Krishna. And Krishna is fulfilling our desire. Just as he fulfilled Dhruva Maharaj's desire, Krishna is fulfilling our desire. And in this mood of illusion, we see duality. We see friends and enemies. We don't see things as they are. As they are, everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. So how to overcome this illusory energy? That also Krishna tells us. Just as we were the cause of coming under the influence of Maya, we can also very easily, he says, cross beyond it. How? He says, This divine energy of mine is very difficult to overcome. But, if one surrenders unto me, then, one can very easily cross beyond it. 
while this illusion seems very powerful, one can very easily cross beyond this energy by devotional service. Service to Krishna. So, we should understand that Maya is just serving Krishna. And Krishna is just fulfilling our desire. So if we have strong desire to overcome Maya, it will happen. She is simply going to follow the directions of her master Krishna. And if we are pleading and praying to Krishna, please help me in overcoming this Maya. If that is our real desire, Krishna will fulfill it. So that by the practice of devotional service, Maya has no scope to come into our influence. And when we become free from the illusory energy, then we no longer see duality. Durga Maharaj was seeing friend and enemy and lamenting how I could see such a thing. Everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. Krishna explains in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, very beautiful verses in the early part of the sixth chapter, verses eight and nine. He says, when you have controlled the mind, you will no longer find distinctions in the material world. You'll see the pebble and the stone and gold, all is the same. You'll see friend and enemy, the envious and non-envious, all the same. This is the spiritual vision that we can achieve. We must come, awaken from our dreaming state, and see every living entity around us, part and parcel of Krishna. The Uttama Adhikari, the Mahabhagavad, they don't see anything but Krishna. They don't see fallen and unfallen. They only see themselves as fallen and everyone very supreme because they are Seeing Krishna residing within the heart of everyone. They're seeing part and parcel. They don't see the body in the temporary coverings. And this is the vision that we can come to also. So when we see duality, sometimes we see duality even in our spiritual life. You know, I like this service, I don't like that service. I like this devotee, I don't like that devotee. I'm enjoying this, I'm not enjoying that. That's duality. When we experience that, we can understand there is some material contamination within our consciousness, within that service. So we can use that, use that symptom of duality to search deep within ourselves and try to pull out, root out, that material contamination. Anytime we experience duality, it is only the influence of Maya. So even in our spiritual life, when we find some duality, some good and bad, let us search out and see how we can overcome that. So, I'll conclude here with just a quick summary. So we talked about real knowledge, how it is descending knowledge coming from Guru and Krishna, to bring about the real truth, to know three things, who am I, who is Krishna, and who, what is my relationship. All other knowledge yields no permanent benefit. The source of our lamentation is the incompleteness we feel, and that completeness can only be experienced in connection with the complete Lord Krishna. The power of pure devotional service is so extraordinary that even the concept of liberation feels very insignificant. Everything in this material world is insignificant and it will lead to lamentation. But by the practice of pure devotional service, na shotati na kamshati, no more lamentation. And one can experience the extraordinary bliss of bhakti by following the process of pure bhakti. That even freedom from birth, death, old age, and disease will find ourselves feeling very insignificant. And finally, we talked about Maya Devi. 
the great servant of Krishna. We are on the same team. She is serving Krishna. We are trying to serve Krishna. So we just have to find ways to overcome her illusory energy so that we no longer see duality and we do so by the process of devotional service. By following the process of devotional service, we can very easily, Krishna says, overcome the influence of love. So Dhruva Maharaj's lamentation is seeing a duality and his mixed bhakti take some great instructions in our practical application of devotions. Please forgive me if I misspoke anything, any mistakes or imperfections. It's just my own coverings. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Any corrections, comments, discussion we can have, questions? Thank you, Prabhuji. Very nicely explained everything. So wonderful. Yes, we have to become serious to serve Krishna and devotees. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Martha. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. The Natranam, all glories to Shla Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. It's uh, like a uh, very, very instructive class, especially in then how we need to practice, and Maya is so strong. Uh, Prabhuji, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, is uh, in our practice of devotional service, we don't realize what we are doing, maybe completely bewildered by the Maya. Even though we are pra- like we are thinking we are practicing uh, the devotional service, but we are totally different from what we need to practice when means from the re- pure devotional service. How we can realize Prabhu that it's a uh, at the end we don't uh, uh, we feel uh, we the, our all on earth is still there all these things. Yeah. Well, one, you have realized it because you are asking the question and seeing it, and it is a great fortune. Krishna, we see that when we see our anarthas, when we see our imperfections in bhakti, that is the greatest blessing Krishna is bestowing upon us because he is shining light on the things we need to work on, that we need to correct. If we don't see them, we cannot correct them. So step one is in seeing these imperfections, seeing, oh, I'm having some material attachment to this bhakti, or I'm having some ego, or so, well, you know, many different anarthas are present. So seeing them is, is, a, is a great benefit, and we should look for them. We should try to find them. We should pray to Krishna. Krishna, help me see the impurities in my bhakti so that I may help me. And then, by the way, can you also help me overcome them? Because I am incapable of fixing them myself. So, when we perform our devotional service, our mood, you know, should be how we can continue to purify our devotional service. And ultimately, only Krishna can enable it, can make it happen. By our own endeavors, we cannot remove our anarthas. But by the mercy of Krishna, if that is our sincere desire, then He will bestow upon us this ability to slowly purify from us. So, how to become free of our anartas, anarta nivritti, that's the fourth stage in the process to devotional service, to Krishna Prema. It starts with shraddha, some faith. And then we associate sadhu sangha. And through the process of bhajana kriya, the practice of bhakti, we purify our anartas. So what to do? We continue to practice the, the Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti principles. Chant our rounds very nicely. The Sangha is extraordinary in that it is encouraging all of us to rise early in the morning and chant our Japa with a very attentive mood. It is the most powerful and most important part of our Sadhana is our chanting. Reading Srila Prabhupada's books 
very important to give us faith in the process of chanting. Rendering practical devotional service. Associating with the devotees. So, to purify of these anartas, we must just pra- put the practice, the principles of devotional service to practice very sincerely and be patient. In time, you will become free from all of these anartas. Keep looking for them, trying to find them, and work on eliminating them. Don't become, you know, demotivated or depressed. Oh, I'm so fallen. I have this anartha that. We all have so many anarthas. But bhakti is so powerful, so purifying. Krishna says in ninth chapter, right, that this is the most purifying. Avitram uttamam, he says. Most purifying. <coughs> that it will purify even me, most fallen, most filthy person. It will purify. So have faith and just be sincere in your practice and work to find it. And we should see the symptoms of the impurities in our bhakti. As I mentioned, one, this duality. As soon as we feel good and bad in our practice of bhakti, we should know there's some impurity. As soon as we feel happiness or distress in bhakti, it means we have some attachment to the result. Oh, I'm very happy to do this service. It means now, I want to do this service, not this service is to please Krishna. So when we experience these emotions, we can flag them, note them. Okay, I need to work on this. And rely on the mercy of Krishna and the practice of bhakti and will become purified. You had a second question, Mataji? Uh, yes, yes, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, thank you so much. It was very nice answer, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhuji, you were telling in sadhana bhakti in uh, you were telling uh, in bhakti rasamrita sindhu all the auspiciousness and then uh, we and two things you were telling. I forgot uh, we are uh, mm. fully happy. Uh, I forgot the point anyway. Uh, I mean, so it's uh, from the very beginning of our sadhana bhakti. We can uh, try our best to do pure devotional service, yes, Prabhu. It's not like that in the certain point we practice pure devotional service. Uh, I'm sorry, Mati, I didn't understand the last piece uh, of your question. You no, say? no, I, I'm, t- I'm asking the question. From the sadhana bhakti, we can mm-hmm. try our best to do the pure devotional service, yes? Means, yes. Um, and I'm, I'm asking, means, uh, in the beginning maybe we may come in different uh, way, but uh, we can practice. Uh, means it's a very difficult thing, uh, means anya vilasita sunyam gan, means everything, but, uh, but we can try, yes, from the And then uh, you were telling two things, uh, sadhana bhakti, the five things uh, Rupa Goswami has given, but all auspiciousness or something you were telling in the sadhana bhakti manifest, yes? Yes. Yeah, so Kleshagni is the first uh, characteristic awarded, and that is, you know, all the difficulties of material life be- dissipate. We, you know, all the difficulties of material life become dissipated, and it's a long discussion of what Kleshagni means and how it works by destroying the root cause of our suffering, the avidya and the bijam, the, um, the, the sinful desires and the sinful reactions. So, Maybe we won't go into that in detail, but understand that the, we become free from the, the, the miseries of material life and all auspiciousness is bestowed upon us in the practice of sadhana bhakti. And remember, the only qualification to practice pure devotional service, Rupa Goswami says, is some attraction, some desire to practice. That's it. That's the only qualification to begin. So, the practice of pure devotional service is within all of our reach if we have a desire for it. And so how to develop a desire for it as we study and we see the greatness of pure devotional service, that will inspire us to set that as our goal. Just like Dhruva Maharaj, he set as his goal the best he could think of on his own, which is this kingdom. 
But if all the options had been laid out in front of him, and then he could set his goal, he surely, as he's now lamenting, would have set a very different goal. So we must study these scriptures given by our six Goswamis. It's presented by Srila Prabhupada to very clearly define what is my goal. And if we establish our goal of awakening pure love of Godhead, then we can begin to work towards that. But if I don't know that that is available, I may aspire for something like liberation, which compared to Bhakti is very insignificant, but certainly very significant compared to my current condition. So like that, by the grace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is shining bright spotlights on, this is the goal. Nadanam, Najanam, Nasanarim, none of that. What do you want? Unconditional love for Krishna. Pure love for Krishna. So we set that as the goal. And we do our best to practice today. Because the only desire, the only qualification is some desire to practice pure devotional service. And if we are not perfect today, we try again tomorrow. And if we are not perfect tomorrow, we try again the next day. And keep trying, keep praying to Krishna and Guru, and they can make it happen. We cannot make it happen on our own. But they can make it happen for us based on the sincerity of our desire. Yes, Prabhu, yes. It's a lot of hope. At least uh, uh, we can desire that and then Krishna, we love Krishna or Guru and they please. They can boast to us. Maybe not today or tomorrow, anytime. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Prabhu. It was very nice question. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, Dhanivad Pranam, Prabhu Ji. Um, all glories to Srila Prabhupada and Gurudev. Um, very, very inspirational and eye-opener class, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. And I had a question, if that's okay. Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just as a follow-up uh, there, uh, when we, have, we were having a conversation with Anjana Gopika Mataji right now, uh, you said, uh, like, when we, uh, for a particular service, if we are happy for a particular service, or if we are kind of, uh, dis- uh, kind of a sad for a, a right, n- a little bit disturbed about a particular service, we should be kind of alert. Now, could you make a uh, clarification when, you, when one is happy about a service and one is enthusiastic about a service? Because we are supposed to be enthusiastic about whatever we do. Now, uh, when we are enthusiastic, the happiness automatically comes. But how can we stay enthusiastic at the same time, be detached and not be, like, happy? So, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice question. Um, let's see, there's a few different ways I can approach this. So, uh, in, in Chaitanya Chaitamrita, uh, uh, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami explains this very beautiful um, uh, situation um, in describing the confidential reasons for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance. It's right in the beginning of Adi Lila. And he describes the mood of Srimati Radharani. And he says that Srimati Radharani is trying to suppress the ecstatic emotions and happiness. She's trying to suppress them so that they don't interfere with her opportunity to render service to Krishna. And, you know, many details he gives very nicely, but, um, but the more she tries to suppress them, the more happiness she experiences because Krishna is so pleased by her selfless nature of service that she doesn't even want to enjoy that fact that she doesn't want to enjoy the service is so pleasing to Krishna that he bestows happiness upon her as if forced upon her and she becomes ecstatic so the practice of pure bhakti is extraordinarily pleasing But the practitioner is not in search of that happiness. It comes because one has only one goal, which is to please Krishna. So when one has such purity of service, happiness is, is, you know, like avalanched upon them. Because Krishna is so happy. So when we experience happiness in devotional service, 
That's okay. We shouldn't think, oh, I'm now in duality. But we should understand, is that happiness coming from my experience and desire to please Krishna? But when unhappiness comes in bhakti, we know absolutely that that means I have some attachment in this service. When these ups and downs occur, right, when there's duality, Duality doesn't exist in the spiritual world. So if duality exists in our bhakti, it means there is some material contamination. So if we are experiencing just happiness, great, you're on the right path. Because you have the goal of only pleasing Krishna. But as soon as duality enters the equation, that's when we can interpret and understand, okay, I have some influence of Maya, some of my impurities are calling in this, and so I'm experiencing ups and downs. And normally it's around my own attachments. I have lost sight that my only goal is to please Krishna. If Krishna, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains in the last verse of Shikshtashtakam, if Krishna wants me to be very, very far away from him, and that will give him happiness, I'll be happy. But in devotional service, we see in practical life, oh, I want to do this service. You know, I want to be the main cook. I don't want to just chop the vegetables. Or I want to dress the deities. I don't want to prepare the arti plates. You know, I want to sing the kirtan. I don't want to be in the chorus. Like that, that emotion and mood there. But the mood, Chaitan Mahaprabhu is getting, if Krishna wants to make me brokenhearted by not being present before me, no problem, because unconditionally, I love him. So, the, the ups and downs occur when we have some personal motive, personal attachment. And that's how we can kind of diagnose that there is some impurity. And then we can double down on our sadhana, double down on our intensity of service, remind ourselves, no, 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 I'm here to please Krishna. As soon as that emotion comes of dissatisfaction, just say to ourselves, no, no, I am here to please Krishna. And immediately your heart will soften again, will become sweet. We just have to talk ourselves through it. It's okay, Mataji? Yes, uh, so as I understand what you're saying is that uh, um, by, when you are enthusiastic about a service, so happiness is basically kind of a, um, uh, a byproduct, right? It will yeah. be a byproduct rather than the goal. So that is, should be the mood. Absolutely. My goal is one thing, please Krishna. Mm. Okay. That's the goal. Not yeah. to become free from my arthritis and gray hair and old age and disease and <laughs> my neighbor who's annoying and the dog and the mother-in-law and this and that. No, that's, that's all my material desires. Mm. My goal, please Krishna. Yeah. When my goal becomes just to please Krishna, the byproduct, as you nicely, eloquently said, is extraordinary bliss and happiness. So that was my comment I made earlier. The more we try to enjoy, the less we do. The more we try to be enjoyed by Krishna, the more we enjoy. Say that one more time. The more we try to enjoy, the less we do. The more we try to be enjoyed by Krishna, the more we enjoy. So our goal is one. Anukulena Krishna Anushilanam. Favorably please Krishna. I have no desires for myself. Nadanam Najanam Nasundari. Nothing I want. Not even happiness. That purity is what pleases Krishna so much. Just like a child. When a child goes to mother and renders some service, but says, Mother, I'll do this service because I want some ice cream. Well, mother is pleased, at least doing some service, but she knows there's a motive behind it. But when a child comes and renders service, says, Mother, I just want to help you. Now that is extraordinarily pleasing to mother. 
And she'll give many ice creams. More than what he could have even asked for. I'm speaking from personal experience. That's how it works. When we go to Krishna with just a goal to please him, he becomes so happy, so enthused, so much love. He showers mercy. When we go with a desire, eh, he'll fulfill it. But we'll lament like Dhruva Maharaj. I asked for a few pieces of broken rice when I could have achieved Krishna Prema. Okay? Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Yeah, it helped. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Dhanvat Pranam. All praise to Shiloh Prabhupada, all praise to Guru Maharaj. Prabhuji, I had a query. I don't know that the, uh, the situation which comes up uh, many times that you have a desire to do service, you are given a service, but then there are some conditions which arise and you cannot do that service. So when such a thing happens, what should be the mode that we should take in? That was it Krishna's mercy that we didn't, could not do it? Because at the end it happens that you realize that yes, you, it was good that I could not do that service because this was the reason behind it. But when that reason comes to know, we know about it later on. But at that specific moment, what should, how should we deal with it? Deal with it in this way, very clearly, in two lines of thought here. One, uh, Krishna's plan is perfect. Just go with Krishna's plan. But don't use that to rationalize our lack of sincerity or lack of effort. So, we do our best. We try our best. We do 110% of what our potential is and let Krishna's plan reign supreme. Whatever Krishna's plan is, will be perfect. So, if we're given a service, but due to extraordinary circumstances we can't do, that is best. Because Krishna didn't want it to happen. If it happens, that is also best because Krishna wanted it to happen. That is our mood. That's it. Just let Krishna's plan reign supreme. If, if Dhruva Maharaj had gone to Krishna with no desire, say, Krishna, I just want to satisfy you. Do with me what you want. How would that compare to where he is? At? That's what he is lamenting. But when we put our plan into Krishna's mind, then he has to think about fulfilling those. That's why we ended up here. Because we told Krishna our plan. Instead of taking Krishna's plan. So better we take Krishna's plan. Let it, let it reign supreme. But we don't become lazy by that logic. That's why Krishna says, Vigato Jwara. Arjuna tells, fight without lethargy. Just because you're not the owner of the fruits doesn't mean you become lazy. You fight. You give 110%. Let Krishna's plan reign supreme. Then where is the scope of disappointment? You put all the effort in to organizing a program or a festival or something. You put so much sincerity. But then the results don't manifest. We become disappointed. Why? That's what Krishna wanted. We should take satisfaction in the service, not the result. Did I do 110%? If I did, great. It's so liberating, stress-free. If one person comes or 10,000 comes, no problem. That is Krishna's plan. But often what happens in our service, when we do it and the results come, we feel great. I did it. And when the results don't come, Krishna, you didn't hear me? Were you busy somewhere else? Instead, just let Krishna's plan play out. It is best for us. Our plans are foolish. Foolish, totally foolish. But Krishna's plan is perfect. Okay? Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. 
and prabhu ji like when we do service is it like should we have a certain amount of service or what or service if we can do it we should take it because at certain times it happens that when you're doing service one after the other there are certain devotees will say oh you shouldn't be taking so many services but if we are able to do it if we are given it is it okay still to take it if we can handle that if we can do that like if rather if krishna is allowing you to do it and you can do it properly is it okay to still do it or should we be listening to people and okay like let me just do one service on sunday evening or just me just do it these two services is there something of that sort well that's a very individual and you know specific question so uh it re- depends on you know all the circumstances uh we should not overburden ourselves uh with service we should not you know take so much service that others don't have an opportunity to serve we should not you know do some of those things but whatever service we can do the instruction is 24/7 now 24/7 doesn't mean then we don't sleep we don't take care of the body we don't manage the family you know shila propa once received a letter one of his pujaris and said that you know i'm so busy taking care of the deities and doing offerings and arti and all of this stuff that I don't have time to take care of my children. He became so upset. He said if you don't take care of your children, I will come and take care of them personally. So sometimes <clears throat> in devotional service, you know, we go to the extreme and we take on so much service that we sacrifice our other responsibilities. And and making an assumption that many on this call are in grahastha ashram. So we have responsibilities. So we cannot neglect those responsibilities. Krishna will not be pleased. Yeah, you may do that service, but now you're neglecting his other child. They're all part and parcels of him. You know, sometimes we neglect our spouses or we neglect our children or our parents. But that doesn't please Krishna. Krishna wants us all to nicely come together. So if we're going to step on somebody to do service of course that's not going to be. Now, you know, we have to be mindful on the other side of that which someone may always criticize us if for this that or the other, you know, we can become tolerant, not become inimical to that person, become compassionate and think okay, maybe they're just sending me some important message. So it's a little bit individual but do the best service you can from a practical means but it is very individual you should not compare oh this person is doing so much service and i'm doing less this person is doing less i'm doing more <coughs> am i doing the best of my ability that is an internal individual position thank you sir thank you hari krishna Hare Krishna Prabhu, <clears throat> thank you for your class, all the preparation I know goes into giving the class. <clears throat> um, I do have a couple of questions also. Um, um, one question is, let's see, where to start? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, with this question of 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 you know not seeking happiness for um in one service you know our goal is to please krishna not our personal enjoyment from doing any particular service so that is there um but at the same time um you know we are all individuals and as individuals whether as conditioned souls or in this you know as perfected souls my understanding is that we all have different propensities you know um and so because of that we gravitate toward one type of service 
over another. And because we have these varying propensities, you know, we will feel more fulfilled by doing one type of service over another. And so um, I'm trying to reconcile this with the fact that we don't pursue service for our own sense of enjoyment, you know? Yeah. No, it's a nice question. And I think, um, you know, there's, it, there's a very important aspect of, of <coughs> service. And if we look at our entire history, we study all the past acharyas, there's a common theme a single thread that unites all of their approaches to service. And it goes all the way back to, Krishna, to Arjuna's position at the end of Bhagavad Gita. And he says, Krishna Vishnanam Tapa. <clears throat> I am now prepared to follow. So the best way to practice devotional service is to follow what's asked of us by our superiors. Now that takes a very humble, it requires a very humble position because, you know, we want to do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And we have to see that that person will also recognize what are our propensities and put us in a position, in a situation that will give us the, 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 the opportunity to be successful. But if we see, you know, one of the pastimes that really struck me, I know when I read it, um, was with uh, Raghunath Das Goswami uh, in Chaitanya Chaitanya. It explains the great um, endeavor he took to go to Jagannath Puri and be in the company of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And after so much endeavor and so much effort, he reached the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu before him. And immediately, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Okay, you now go and serve Sarup Dhamana. Now, in an impure state, we would become devastated. Oh no, I want to serve you, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I want to serve you. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked him, you now go serve Sarup Dhamma. And Brother Hazu was in bliss, ecstatic mood. Because his bliss was executing the instruction of the Lord. So, and that one example, we see, you know, Narutam Das Thakur was personally given Krishna Prema by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, deposited in the Padma River. Yet, when the instruction came, you take initiation from Lokanath Goswami. He went to Vrindavan, and when denied, performed very menial service to follow that instruction to take initiation from Lokanath Goswami. Because that was the instruction given to him, and that became his life mission. And when he took initiation from him, Lokanath Goswami said, now you go learn from Jiva Goswami. And Nortam Das Thakur went to Jiva Goswami and began to learn from him. And then Jiva Goswami said, okay, you have now learned. You go take this bullock cart full of books with Srinivas Acharya and Shyamananda Pandit and you guys go distribute books. And like that, all, everything he was doing was the execution of instructions from his gurus, shiksha gurus or diksha gurus. And like this, we can quote every Srila Prabhupada. His whole life mission was fulfill the instruction of his spiritual master. So when we render devotional service in the instruction of our gurus, we are following the perfect process of devotional service. And we can take comfort that a qualified, a bona fide guide to us 
will understand our propensities, will put us in a position to be successful, and that way we'll simultaneously achieve, you know, what you are asking, which is how do we, you know, play to our tendencies and natures, but also not develop that personal attachment. So we take shelter of those who have our best interest in heart, who can guide us purely, and bring us along in the process of bhakti. And that way we'll remain detached and not fall into the trap of having those personal motives, but also will be known that we'll be put in situations that will, you know, recognize our tendencies and propensities and put us in a position to be successful. And that way we're protected on both sides. Okay? Yes, that was very nice. Very nice answer. Um, yeah, a- another question that I had. Um, um, <laughs> once again, I'm trying to figure out which question I asked. But, okay, I will move on um, to the subject of duality. You know, this, this word duality is always, like, um, a bit challenging for me because, I don't know, it seems to be, it seems to have different meanings, I think, in different contexts, or, so somehow it's a little bit cloudy for me. Um, so one thing I've heard is that, du- you know, it's not that there's duality only in the material world. There is, you know, like, like we often hear, everything here is a reflection of what already exists in the spiritual world. So it's not that there isn't any variety of, as you know, using your example, there isn't any variety of temperature or climate, you know. Um, you know, in this material world, you know, there's this variety. In the spiritual world, you also have, you know, different seasons, you know. So the duality is not that there isn't variety in the spiritual world. It's duality comes when we see this material world as separate from, from Krishna, you know. This world is Krishna's energies. So... I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to get deeper understanding of this word duality, and how it applies to the spiritual world. Yeah, and I, I think I, I understand where you're headed with this. So, um, you, you, you're, you're spot on. There's extraordinary variety in the spiritual world. <laughs> Because whatever variety we see here in the material world is but a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. So to the, to the extent there's variety here, there's certainly pure variety in the spiritual world. The difference is, in the material world, we have likes and dislikes. I like mm-hmm. them like that. So amongst the variety we, we, we perceive, there's likes and dislikes. But in the spiritual world, there's no likes and dislikes. Everything is perfect. But there's still variety. I can have a rasgula or a gulab jamun. That's variety. But I like them both. It's day and night. That's variety. But they're both equally pleasing. It's warmer or cooler. Mm-hmm. When Krishna, this is explained in the Brihad Bhagavatam, you know, when Krishna is playing in the forest, and, and he begins to feel a little warm. You know, the cloud moves over him and provides the, sh- the shade between him yes. and the sun. And then sometimes, in the ecstasy of seeing the pastimes of Krishna, the clouds will begin to tear and shower a light rainfall. But that isn't, oh no, our time to play is now being ruined by rain. That's <laughs> world when we're on the beach and we want to enjoy and the rains come. But in the spiritual world, that's also blissful. The cooling rains have come. So the variety doesn't lead to likes and dislikes. It's all 
extremely pleasing. So mm -hmm. each aspect of variety is pleasing. But in the material world, the variety is we like some, then we don't like some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perception of variety, uh, sorry, the perception of the good and bad, though, it is perception, not reality, is due to the influence of illusion, of maya. Everything is bad in the material world when it's used to please my senses. <coughs> what I perceive to be good that my senses enjoy is still bad because it's going to lead to misery. But conversely, everything in the material world, when it's used in the service of Krishna, is good. All variety is good. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice subtle point you're raising, but in a very important one, that you know, variety isn't a source of duality. Mm -hmm. Illusion mm -hmm. and the loss of consciousness of who I am is a source of duality. So there is no duality in the spiritual world, yet there is great variety. But it is all pleasing. Okay. Yeah, so yes, it was beautiful. So duality is really um, not that there's not variety. You know, duality is to um, perceive the, 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 the variety in terms of my own sense of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. which that doesn't exist, of course, in the spiritual world. Exactly. All the different variety in the spiritual world are opportunities for Krishna, and thus there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, <clears throat> just one last question. Um, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we are to absorb ourselves in the sound vibration of Maha Mantra a couple of hours a day, um, and, you know, and the point of all of our service is this absorption, you know. And so, you know, since there are these um, nine processes of devotional service, um, that, that, you know, if, which each one of them can lead to perfection, you know, without the help of any of the others, the, the, you know, they're the exemplars for each of the nine processes where each of the exemplars reached perfection by performing each one of those nine processes. So since they, they appear to be equal from that perspective, I wonder why um, the uh, the example or the instruction of the acharyas is to for us to do two hours of absorption in chanting. Why not two hours of absorption in hearing or two hours of absorption in you know deity service? You know, yep. you know uh, why not? You understand my question. Mm -hmm. I do, and um, it, it's you know again you're right. The two hours of absorption of chanting is the instruction, and I want to just you know clarify as the minimum preliminary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. goal is obviously 24/7, and that's the mm -hmm. manifest once we actually have a you know a taste for the holy name. This uh, this ruchi, this taste develops then. There's no need to count the number of times we're chanting. It just happens due to our great taste. But the, the more practical, just to get to your practical question now, um, you know, the, the potency of the holy names are well established in our Shastra as the most powerful means to pierce through all of the, the conditioning of material life. You know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again, Shikshtashtakam prayer, Nidjasharva Shakti. All of his Shakti, all of his potency has been embedded within the holy names. And so by chanting out the holy names of the Lord, we're drawing upon all of the energy of the Supreme Lord to help us in our process of devotional service. So you're right, they're all all nine processes of devotional service are 
any one of them, Prabhupada comments in, 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 in Srimad Bhagavatam, any one of them are capable of bringing about perfection of pure devotional service. But the most potent and we can say the highest you know, probability of success, if you will, is by following the instruction of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who came up for one reason. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came for one reason, at least externally, I should say. The external reason he came was to show the path of how to awaken Krishna Prema. He spoke in Bhagavad Gita, what to do? Surrender unto me. But we're not ready to surrender. So Krishna showed, in the mood of coming as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how to do it. And what was the single activity Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went all over India preaching and Lord Nityadana went door to door, straw between teeth, begging, chant, chant, chant. So why they picked that? Yeah, why? (laughs) Because it's the most potent and most powerful process to awaken love of God. There are other processes too, but this is the most potent, most easiest, easy I should say, simplest process. And so that's why it's the recommended process in this age. Harinam, 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 Eidhivam, Kalam, Nesteva, 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 Katirnyata. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would quote this verse from the Brihan Narada Purana, which says, in his age of Kali, there is no other way, there is no other way, there is no other way. Nashtaeva, Nashtaeva, Nashtaeva. <coughs> then, Harinama, Harinama, Harinama. Chanting of the holy names, chanting of the holy names, chanting of the holy names. Three times for emphasis it's given that in this age of Kali, this is the means, this is the process. Yeah, in the grand scheme, in the total totality of creation, there are you know, these nine processes, devotional service. Mm-hmm. But this is the most potent process. So, okay, so that's the actual point for me, is that, I mean, I certainly agree and accept all that you've said, but, <clears throat> um, you know, I guess the, the, what I'm still trying to reconcile is the fact that chanting is the most potent, yet... We also hear that all nine processes are equal. You know what I'm saying? How is it that chanting is the most potent, yet, yet all nine processes are equal? Uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada always uh, often comments that shrav- uh, shravanam, hearing, is the most important. Mm-hmm. And I, I can point to the equal nature of that. Uh, because the Srila Prabhupada speaks about the great importance of Shravanam, hearing, to then bring about this taste for chanting, hearing about Krishna, hearing about His glories, hearing about this potency of the Holy Name, then inspires one to Kirtanam. But, so, they're all capable, they all have the potency, but again, it's based on Shastra and based on the instruction of Acharya, this is the most potent process in this current age. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, Prabhu. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you so much for your wonderful answers. Mm. Other questions or comments? Corrections, additions to anything I've spoken? Please feel free. Hare Krishna, is there any comment and comment or question for Prabhuji? It's a little late. Thank you so much Prabhuji for coming and giving your valuable association and very instructive class. Uh, now we can see our obeisances to Prabhuji and all the Vaishnava devotees, Vansa Kalpa, Tarvesa, Kepa, Sindhu, Yevacha, Tita, Pavanakya, Vaishnava. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for your succession. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. And good division of the ki jai. Jai jai. It's good, Nitya Krishna Das Prabhu ki jai. Jai.